when we're talking about home ranges and territories, which we've done so a number of times over the course of this lecture, uh, what we're talking about is that some animals have territories, not all animals, uh, but all animals have a home range that they use. Now, it's written quite clearly over here. Basically, a home range is an area that an animal will use for all sorts of things. It's large, it just uses it for feeding, for shelter, drinking, you know, all the daily things that it has to do. Um, and within that home range, especially if it's an animal like a male lion, who's got this huge home range, he's got a territory that's a bit smaller, he's got a huge home range. And within that home range, he might have a, a number of other uh, female prides that move around within his area. He doesn't necessarily defend it. He might venture out of his territory and explore a bit, but he won't start marking to, because if he starts marking, he's basically claiming that as his territory, and he might start to fight with another lion who says, no, actually, lion, this is my area, and then it can be a bit of a problem. Um, so um, when an animal is venturing in its home range, it may well pass into the territories of others, but it has to be very submissive. If it displays any sort of behavior which can be a threat to whichever animal's territory that is, there can be real problems. Now, a territory itself is usually smaller. It's um, within the home range, and it is a smaller area, and it's defended aggressively from other animals of the same species and quite often of the same sex. So a female leopard, for example, will often allow a male leopard to move through, no problem there because it's mating opportunities. Uh, but if a female leopard comes into her territory, she will aggressively defend and chase this other animal off. She doesn't want it in there because that is the area that she raises her offspring. That is the area that she wants to keep her baby safe as it grows into a young adult itself. So that's very, very important to understand the difference. A home range is not defended. The uh, territory definitely is defended. Now, animals like elephants, for example, don't have a territory at all. Uh, they have a home range that can be vast, especially in areas where um, food might be quite scarce, like in the Namib Desert. Um, or it can be quite small in areas where there's food abundant all year round, like the Okavango Delta, for example. And it can change in size. An elephant's home range can become bigger in, in, in lean times or get smaller when times are really, really good. Um, Sue, you're saying that wild dogs have a huge home range. They absolutely do. In fact, most game reserves in South Africa uh, that put wild dogs in their area. So remember, South Africa is quite different to a lot of others because it's quite a built up country. It's, it's expanding a lot. Human, humans are expanding quite a lot. It's developing quickly. Um, the, the game reserves usually have sort of a fence around them to keep the animals safe in a safe environment without human um, intervention from outside. Now, wild dogs, painted wolves, are incredibly good at deciding that they don't really need to be inside that area. And they'll dig under the fence and they'll disappear and go start doing their own missions. And so sometimes on game reserves where they're not supposed to be wild dogs, all of a sudden there's a pack of wild dogs just running through. I mean, we've seen that so many times. So that's uh, really a quite an exciting thing. At uh, Pride Lands, actually, there are two different groups of wild dogs that frequently come through the camp and they often come to drink at a little dam, which is that... A dam that's right there at the camp, which is pretty cool. And then on the next slide, there's a little infographic there where you can see more of a stylized thing. So you can see there, there's a territory usually separate from the territories of others, um, not overlapping, but in the middle of that huge area where all these animals have territories, the, the territory, the small area that's defended to raise the youngster is not always ideal because sometimes, especially if the the animal, let's, let's use rhinos, which is, this is an example of, it might be a slightly weaker rhino, doesn't have the best territory with access to water, but it needs to get to the water. So that then becomes part of its home range, an area that it will often go to in order to get a resource that it needs. Now, if it has to pass through the territory of another rhino, it must simply act submissive. It better not uh, kick its dung over and open onto a pile of the dominant male's dung because that's a threat. And if it does see the other male, it has to keep its head low and probably make some vocal communications to just say, hey, I'm not trying to cause trouble. I just want to pass through to get to the water. And generally speaking, although it might be uncomfortable, they'll pass their own ways. Because as I said before, remember, animals don't want to fight if they can avoid it. Imagine two large animals like rhinos having a fight simply because they want to have a drink of water when it can be avoided. Injury to both, chances are very high, and so they want to avoid that. So simply uh, act submissive. 
So there's more or less a brief description of how territories and home ranges work. Remember, not all animals have territories, but almost all, anim all, all animals will have a home range. Thank and that's it for me. Thank you Simple very much. and easy. Thank you very much, Mike and Dave. This is my last little section here. So just to introduce you bri very briefly, I'm conscious of time. We're over an hour now. Um, and this will give you a bit of a taste of the, the tracking online course, which effectively goes over how to identify animals' tracks, what animal signs to be aware of when you, when you are walking, so that you are able to form a mental image of what is going on around you. Now, now tracking started, we think, 100,000 years ago, maybe 150,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers, it was their main means of, of finding food. It developed for the reasons of human survival. Unlike what uh, many uh, communities in the West believe, it is, it is not a mysterious, mystical art. It is a, a, a skill like any, like playing rugby or cricket or soccer. There are some people who can do it well, who have a, an aptitude for tracking and who can come, become really good at it. The last two strongholds for traditional wildlife tracking skills left in Southern Africa are in the Kalahari, the sand people, which is, uh, there's a picture of two young sand men on the slide there, and the Shangan people in the northeastern part of South Africa where we are, where we uh, are uh, talking to you from now, um, the Kruger National Park, Southern Mozambique, even Southern Zimbabwe. And basically, in a nutshell, Tracking is the knowledge and particularly the skill required to identify, interpret, and then follow animal sign in order to find that animal and in order to be able to make an interpretation of, of their behavior. And tracking represents some of the most complex forms of proficiency in the world of wildlife. Um, like I alluded to earlier, it can be trained um, and evaluated objectively to a, a real high degree of competency. If you've got good eyes, an able body, um, uh, the, a balance of, of rational thought and creativity, you can become a really, really good tracker. And, track the, and the and Eco Training runs 14 day courses, as well as it includes tracking as part of its prof one year long professional field guide program, um, and, and where we teach you how to track and we evaluate you in both the components of track and sign and trailing which i'll tell you a little bit about later or in a minute i'm not going to take long now tracking has although it's an ancient skill it's got mo um, relevance in modern conservation efforts in ecotourism for finding animal trackers are required to find animals for people to go and see wildlife protection protection or animal uh, monitoring and animal uh, anti-poaching those are the areas, the sectors of the conservation industry where tracking is, is incredibly valuable and, and important that we keep alive. So the components of tracking, tracking is, is, is just very broadly speaking, the two components that would be relevant for you to know are the one, the tracks and signs. That's the study of any animal that touches the ground, their sign. Um, and then the second is the trailing. That's the following of an animal's trail to find that animal. And if tracking were a language, the tracks and signs would be akin to the alphabet, to the ABC. And, and, and the trailing would be equivalent to the reading of that language. You have to be able to spell and string words and sentences together in order to read a language. And that's, what, that's, that's the difference between the two. And at Eco Training, we, we immerse students into both those components, the tracks and signs and the trailing. And here's a, 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 a bit of a double, double click, if you like, on tracks and signs. It includes all animal signs from the footprints, droppings, bones, hairs, feathers, territorial markings, and even the vocalizations, even some of the calls that Mike and David were talking to you about earlier. And there's a picture of a, of a, a lion's track walking from right to left and a, a very fresh brown ahina dropping there. Um, and so that would be the tracks, and, 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 and we talk about insect tracks, birds, we look at birds' tracks, antelope's tracks, right up to elephants' tracks. So we, we will want to know, we will be able to teach you to differentiate between a grasshopper's track and a beetle's track. And at the evaluation at the end of the program, we will, we will, want to, we will ask you to explain the differences. So we go, it goes into real fine detail on the tracks and signs. 
the, the and what's interesting is unlike many other uh for example birding where you you're, you're looking at different species of birds when you look at a lion's track it can come up so differently depending on the substrate that it's walking on so when you get when you get to know what a lion's track looks like in deep sand or soft sand like you can see on the screen that may change if, if the animal walks over wet sodic soil or um, hard granitic soil so you, uh, it, it, it takes a long time to master, and I think that's why we, you, people talk about tracking as being mystical, because there's just so much diversity in the sign, so much variation in the sign, and it takes many years. You can teach a tracker to be competent in about a year, but it takes, that's the foundation, it takes a, a lifetime to really uh, master it, if indeed you master it at all. Um, and this is just um, a sort of an academic or theoretical breakdown of tracking. We want to know who made the track. That's the ability to recognize and identify. We want to know when the track was to analyze it, to, to, to understand how old or fresh the track was, aging of the track. We want to know what the animal was doing once we know the track is there and how old it is. What was it doing? Was it hunting, stalking, uh, sleeping, feeding? So you make an interpretation based on the sign. Once you now start to follow that animal's trail, are you're not always able to see every single piece of evidence. Um, sometimes animal tracks are very, very faint and obscure, and, and the sign can be incredibly subtle. So this now demands the tracker to start to anticipate, to, to predict where the animal is going. And only the, the, the best trackers are able to predict with any form of accuracy consistently. And then, of course, Context is always an important animal. Animals do different things in different areas for different reasons. And trackers need to adapt all the time. So knowing about the lion that you follow, knowing its behavior, knowing even its personality, knowing its territory, knowing the terrain it occupies makes you so much more effective as a tracker as a versus if you, if you didn't know any of that and you just were trying to follow its sign. I remember... My, uh, my friend and I, Renius and Klong, when I tracked grizzly bears in Yellowstone in, in North America, and for the first week or two, we really struggled because we had never seen a grizzly bear, let alone its track. So we were missing half the context. Um, we, we didn't understand bear behavior. We didn't know which bushes they were feeding on, how they moved. We were o only able to follow their sign. And until we started to get more immersed in their behavior, we were, we were very limited in our, in, in our ability. This is just from this morning of a video rhino here to show you about the trailing, the following of a rhino now. trail. We'll see how long it takes us. Beautiful fresh tracks. You can see the earth and the wet leaf from where the rhino has sprayed, marking his territory. Yeah, the rhino has been chewing. Scuffed a bit of mud on this log. We've been going just over three hours now. Uh, group is starting to tire a little bit. Renius, though, ever present energy. See where the rhino is rubbed here up against this branch. The ability to recognize and interpret the smallest detail is absolutely key to tracking success. Ox is calling, showing it too close by. Well done, guys. Hey, finally got him. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that little short video. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We've got, the, as promised, we've got a question we'd like to ask you. Um, the next slide is going to be the question. The person quickest to write the correct answer in the chat will win a free online eco-training 
uh, course, online course of your, of, your, of your choosing. So that would be the, the field guide program, the nature enthusiast, the trails guide program. And if you want to wait a little bit, the birding and tracking are coming soon. We will announce the dates quite in the next uh, 10 days to two weeks. Um, we've, we've, uh, uh, COVID has, has messed with our plans a little bit. People who are writing the programs have, have been down uh, ill, but uh, we'll, we'll be up and running hopefully soon. And we'll announce to you when we're going to give you, uh, when we'll be running the tracking and the birding. So here's the question. What is it called when an elephant bull's testosterone levels are elevated? And maybe, Mike, uh, could you tell us who gets the right, the first answer? There's so many people answering. There's so many. <laughs> okay, who was first? Who was first? Who was hold first? on, hold on. I'm trying to find it. I'm trying to find it. <laughs> who was first? There's literally so many. <laughs> <laughs> who was first? first? Oh, my goodness. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Almost there. Hold, hold on. The first person was Remy. Remy Leroy. R R Spell that for me. R E M I. Remy Leroy. That was quick. I think it wasn't even the millisecond. He saw that question and he knew that oh, I've, I've got it. Well done, Remy Leroy. Please be in contact with us uh, with Anami uh, or inquiries at Eco Training. Congratulations to you and uh, yeah, let us know. And for the rest of you, please do visit our, our website. There, there are lots of courses, the practical courses. We, we would love to see you in, in, at our camps. And um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a great pleasure. And thank you to Mike and David for your deep knowledge and your wonderful presentation skills and awesome stories. So thank you all. It was a real pleasure. Thanks so much for joining everyone. We'll see you soon, hopefully. So thanks so much for watching. If you liked this video and you want to see more just like it, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons.